as leaders, you have to look into the future and you've got to sort of strategically place bets about what is going to work for you, what you're going to be able to uh, capitalize on five years, ten years down the line, because that's your job as, as the leaders. You've got to find the future in the current. Uh, but, you know, you still have to deliver on your quarterly numbers. How do you deal with that and what is the, what is the, 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 the biggest problem that you face with the kind of expectation management that you have to deal with, especially doing this quarter after quarter? I think... Uh, or is too much made no, out of it? Let, let's think about multiple stakeholders here. So there is the customer set, there is the employee set, there are the investors, and then there is, of course, the media. I think uh, the <laughs> problem is more on the right-hand side rather than on the left-hand side. <laughs> it's, it's, it's us, is it? <laughs> Salil, are we the problem? So I, I, I would not say you are the problem, yeah, Shireen. Yeah. I think you are very much part of the solution. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the, the, way I would, <laughs> the way I would look at it is if you work to see where your clients are going and make sure those expectations and you, you try to build relevance to them, all the other things sort of follow through. And, of course, there is intensity, but it's in any... I would say listed enterprise, any enterprise which is trying to do something. Mm. And th there is fortunately a way to drive that because you know, these are at the end hugely profitable growing businesses. Yeah. So there's an expectation that different stakeholders have. But if you remain relevant to your clients and you make sure that your employees are seeing the change in the reskilling, yeah. you usually are okay. But Shireen, let me just challenge again. Yeah. You know, because are, are, you also not, industry, are you also being nice to me or not being nice to me? It's, it's dangerous <laughs> not to be nice to you, Shireen. No, no I'm kidding. No, I, look, I think we, we're not an industry going through a time of, you know, where we're saying to people, hey, give us a stopgap, right? Because things have to sort so, of readjust from disruption and then come back. That's yeah. not the conversation yeah. any of us yeah. are having. So I think I struggle with that question a little bit. The other is I think most stakeholders are quite smart. So if you start with investors, Investors understand. Investors understand that, hey, look, if I need to be making investments in the short term and this is how you measure me in terms of input metrics that you see and output metrics that they see, people understand. I mean, if you're investing in a product business, you're not going to see returns for a long time before you invest in the product. So mm. I think you can talk to stakeholders, whether they be investors, whether they be customers, whether they be internal stakeholders, and be able to explain a roadmap that you need to take. But I think it's important to underscore that this is not an industry going through a phase where there's going to be complete Sorry. disruption and a pause before we come back as an industry. Sure. But since you talked about investors, and I want to ask the three of you, what we have seen, for instance, in the U.S., uh, is a lot of activist shareholders, and they have, in a sense, called the shots as far as tech companies are concerned. Other companies also, but in, in uh, tech companies specifically. Does that, is that a concern? Could that blindside you, or is it not relevant in the Indian context? You know, I don't know. We haven't seen it in India so, so much so far. Is it possible? It certainly is. You know, frankly, uh, we don't worry about it so much just given that we have a strong promoter ownership in the company that allows us to be a, uh, at some level protected from that kind of challenge. But it's certainly something that one has to be cautious of and think about uh, as one is making decisions. Rajesh? Oh, you have a very activist chairman. Salim? <laughs> 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 I think if, if you, you know, the, the view we have is if there's inefficiency in the business, yeah. there'll be someone, whether it's activists or someone, will want to you know, have, have a view on it and try to get you to make some changes. Okay. So in that sense, if you're constantly paranoid yourself and, and making those changes, then you're usually okay. You know, I want to talk to the three of you about uh, the M&A route uh, for over the next decade and what that is actually going to be able to used, uh, be used for. Richard, I'll start by asking you because I would imagine that of the three, you have been the most aggressive. You've got the String of Pearls acquisition strategy that's been in place now for many years. You do them small, but you've been doing them consistently. Is that going to continue to be the strategy? What is going to drive M&A? Size clearly doesn't seem to be the factor. It seems to be more capability and plugging niches. What will drive M&A for you? I mean, you should ask. Sarah just bought a company yesterday. I know, just, right? just, but, just 48 but, hours ago. I'll no, get to him as well. But, you know, I'm a, personally, I'm a huge believer in M&A. I think it's a very powerful medium and way to very visibly communicate that you are serious about investing, to very quickly acquire new capabilities. So I'm a big believer in M&A. We've done a fair number over the last few years. We've done less so over the last 18 months. But I think we will continue Why is to leverage. That? No, it's just the fact that these M&A is binary, right? You buy certain, some things work out, some things don't work out. But as a tool, we believe in it very strongly. I think you've got to be very careful about not going 
getting carried away and going overboard and how you integrate new capabilities, how do you make them work within your system, I think is very, very critical. Uh, so you've got to find the right balance and not go completely berserk. I think it's also important that we don't, we don't look at M&A as a tool for acceleration of growth. We look at it as a tool for acceleration of capability. And so different organizations use that, that tool differently as well. We're very clear that we are in the capability bucket as opposed to the growth acceleration bucket. Okay, what capabilities do you believe you will continue to need to plug by way of the M&A route? No, I think you will continue to look at capabilities around new age cloud capabilities. You know, how do you significantly enhance digital capabilities around strategic design, for example? Uh, how do you open up new geographies? which are still small and you want to be more relevant and scaled in those kinds of markets. So things like that. Salil, you've just done one. You closed it, what, 48 hours ago. Uh, what is going to drive M&A for you? What's going to be the rationale as we move forward in the next decade? So in M&A, really, uh, it's a tool which can be hugely positive. Uh, there are always challenges where, you know, finding the right cultural fit, finding the right integration. We're assuming that you get by those uh, over time. We've done three types of acquisitions in the last two years. Uh, one is in the cloud area. We've done two companies there. One is in what we call experience, which is how all of us experience technology. And it's a new way of integrating digital studios in. And the third is in the platform, the discussion we had earlier, to scale out some new platform. So anything that helps us be more relevant to our clients, those are the areas we'll drive uh, m and in. Fortunately, I mean, all, all the companies here have a very strong balance sheet, huge cash generation. Mm -hmm. So we have the toolkit to do this. It's more a function of integration and cultural fit. Those are things you have to watch out for. You've perhaps been the most uh, sort of held back when it comes to M&A uh, at TCS, Rajesh. Uh, why is that? Actually, uh, we have been systematically investing. So if you look at it across all three dimensions, and like Salil and Rishad said, whether it is from a services perspective or products perspective or from new markets perspective. We have always systematically grown, especially on geographical expansion. M&D is our preferred route, um, whether it is Latin America, Europe, uh, Japan. We have always gone m and joint ventures, uh, systematic uh, acquisitions. So it's not that we have not uh, done it, but we are more, uh, more measured. Industry experts discuss how technology...